Thanks for joining my wife, son, and I on this week's Alive with Kong. In our last program, we talked about reaching the next generation. We learned why it's so crucial for us as believers to invest into the lives and spiritual destinies of our young people today. The youth of our day represents our collective future. What a privilege it is for us to have the chance to impart a legacy of empowerment and inspiration into their lives that will affect the generations to come. Before we get into the Word and explore what it means to effectively reach young people for Christ, let's take a look at this song performance by the youth of City Harvest Church. All alone in the darkness of these worlds anyone hear the sound of this one cry the voice in silence crying now for hope will you be there will you be there these eyes are searching for the hope of life your hands are stretching out for someone to hold In the darkness of it all Will you feel the loss? Will you feel the loss? Will you hear the cry? Will you give that hope? Will you be the help this one voice? Will you hear the cry? Will you give that hope? Will you be the help of this one voice? like a lot of rules. I just don't have time. With our culture changing at a fast pace, how can the gospel fit into these lives? Kong believes we must reach the next generation now. Connect today to get your copy of Kong's three-part series, The Next Generation Initiative. In these messages, he'll share that though the gospel message may be sacred, our methods are not. Learn how to powerfully and relevantly engage with the next generation that God has put in your life. The Next Generation Initiative is a three-message series that will help you to be relevant and to gain a voice that speaks clearly into the hearts of the next generation youth. So connect with Kong at konghee.com to order a copy of The Next Generation Initiative. 
Kong believes we must reach the next generation now. Connect today to get your copy of Kong's three-part series, The Next Generation Initiative. Be relevant and help raise up a generation for Christ that will take the nations by storm. Fifty years ago, the greatest revival ever in Asia was birthed by a 25-year-old young man by the name of Yonggi Cho. I too started City Harvest at the age of 25, and it was also a revival among the young people. But if we don't keep on reaching out to the youth, any revival will be over in one generation. Any revival in any nation. Our God is a transgenerational God. The fact that He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob tells me one thing. He wants His revival to pass on from generation to generation to generation. Oh, come on, you believe that? Give the Lord a big hand. Hallelujah. Missiologists have coined the term the 1040 window, which is the area of the globe that is considered the most unreached people's region in the world. But many scholars are saying what's important is not the 1040 window, but the 1330 window. And this is not a geographical region, but we are talking of an age group of people between 13 to 30 years of age, which is the greatest harvest field in our time. According to the United Nations, 60% of the whole world are age 24 and under. And we need to reach them for two simple reasons. Number one, this age group is most open to the gospel of Christ. 90% of all Christians receive Jesus Christ before 30 years of age. 75% are born again before they are 19. Now, by a show of hands, how many of you in this room receive Christ under the age of 19? On the count of three, lift up your hands. One, two, three. Lift up your hands right now. Look at that, huh? Almost all of you in this room. There's a second reason. The most important age group is this group because they are the future of the church and they are the future of the world. If you reach the youth, you are going to affect the future of Christianity and you're going to affect the future generation. Acts 2 verse 17 the Bible tells us that from the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago, God has been pouring out His Holy Spirit upon the young people. It says, I will pour out of my spirit in all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see vision. Your old men shall dream dreams. Now notice four groups of people mentioned here, and three out of four are the young people. You know, at the age of 17, Joseph received a dream that he's going to be a deliverer and a savior for his generation. David was at most 1617 when he killed the lion and the bear, and 19 years old when he defeated Goliath and set the people free from the taunting of the Philistines. Samuel was just a kid under the age of 12 when God communed with him and told him things concerning the future of Israel. When Israel was in the final stage of backsliding, whom did God send to wake them up? God sent a young man called Jeremiah. Everybody say Jeremiah. Jeremiah. A person so young, he felt unqualified. So what did God say? Do not say, I'm just a youth. For you shall go to all whom I have sent you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Let me tell you, young people, those of you under the age of 25, there is fire in your bones and a word from God from heaven for you to speak to your generation, to bring deliverance to your people. Oh, come on, give God a big clap. <laughs> Timothy was just a young man, maybe 19 to 25 years old, when he became the senior pastor of the great Ephesian church, a church of 60,000 members. Can you imagine 25 years old, you have 60,000 members. He felt the pressure. That's why Paul said to him, God did not give you a spirit of fear, young Timothy, but of love, of power, and a sound mind. All throughout the Bible, when you read it, God uses young people mightily in the forefront of His purpose. Think about Esther. Think about Solomon. Think about Josiah. 
We talk about Daniel the other night. Think about Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Think about Mary. Think about Jesus. The disciple of John was maybe 16 years old when he followed Jesus. Even when the ladies went to the tomb on Resurrection Sunday and they couldn't find Jesus, whom did they see? You know what Mark 16, 5 says, entering the tomb? They saw a young man clothed in a white long robe sitting on the right side and they were alarmed. Imagine this, even when God sent an angel, he looked like a young man. You know, the trend is not just in the Bible. It's repeated again and again all throughout church history. Consider the likes of William Booth and Charles Spurgeon and Jonathan Edwards and John Wesley and George Whitfield. They were all in their 20s. When they brought a revival, they changed their generation. So you say, Kong, how do I inspire the young people in my church? How do I inspire the youths in my generation? Let me say that there are five goals for every Christian, and most of you leaders, you know this. Number one is worship. Number two, relationship. Number three, discipleship. Number four, ministry. Number five, evangelism. I mean, this is a common fact that we, we all know. The five things. Worship. When we get born again, the first thing we do we learn to love God. We learn to relate to Him. Now that is the vertical beam. And then after that, it is relationship. We learn to love one another. So you have the vertical beam, loving God wholeheartedly. The horizontal beam, loving people fervently. And then after that, you have discipleship. You get the training. You begin to grow in maturity. And then number four, after you're trained, you start serving ministry, serving God, Serving in the church, serving people. And then number five, evangelism. You want to do missions. You want to win the lost. And yet, let me say, among most Christians and churches, the emphasis looks more like this. Ministry is big. You got to serve, you got to serve. Come on, get involved in serving, get involved in serving. You got to evangelize, bring friends, bring friends, bring friends to the house of God, bring friends to your cell group. And then after that, the next big deal, worship. Worship is huge. I mean, all the young people, they love to worship. So you bring bands to come. They get excited, they want to worship. They have their moss pit in the front. And then this discipleship is a little lower down the list because, well, I'm not sure about discipleship. But right at the end of the list, right at the bottom, that's how much we value relationship. We put relationship right at the bottom. And after a while, doing church seems like very hard work. Members begin to lose their motivation. They dry up. They burn out. They get tired. It's no longer fun or enjoyable coming to church or becoming a Christian. And you got to understand, to the youths, to young people, relationship is key. Everybody say out loud with me. Say, relationship is, key. relationship is key. When Jesus chose the 12 disciples, he chose them so that they might be with him. Jesus chose the 12 young people that they might be with him. His focus is on relationship. Not once in a while, not once a month, but almost consistent every day for three and a half years. Why? Relationship is not something you know in your head. It's a felt thing. Relationship is something to experience. To know God is to experience Him. To know God is to feel Him. So the big question tonight is, do your young people feel your love? Do they feel your care? Cell group leaders, church pastors, do they feel your concern for them? Tonight, my heart beats with a burden for all the young people here in Asia because of all the continents in the world, Asia has the most, the biggest proportion of youths. Let me tell you a few things you need to do. Number one, you got to be present for them. Especially when they go through difficult times, they go through periods of transition. Psalms 23 how do you know 
you have a good shepherd. Because when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. Your shepherd is with me. Friends, listen. Your young people got to feel you are with them when they go through difficult challenges in their growing up years. Through their puberty, their adolescence, as they make choices with their career, you got to be with them consistently. It's not just a one counseling session. It's not just a one visitation. And that leads me to point number two. You got to be consistent. If you want to have a strong youth ministry, you got to be consistent. And God is always consistent with us. How many of you know we may be faithless? Talk to me now, but God is always faithful. It takes time, many years, to build lifelong relationships. A while ago, I have a pastor that gave me a call. He was a missionary sent out to the foreign field. So his little boy, a Singaporean family, they've been living in the missions field for, I don't know, 10, 15 years. This boy has grown up. Now, every Singaporean, when they hit the age of 18, they got to come back to Singapore to serve the army, what we call the national service. The boy that's become a young man came back. He could not relate to the Singapore Armed Forces. He didn't grow up here. He didn't have a sense of patriotism towards the country. Didn't feel like, why should I take up arms and defend my nation? I'm not even sure if this is my nation. I didn't grow up here. He was struggling. Daddy was a pastor, a missionary. He was questioning about church, about God, about the ministry about life. Dad gave a call. He said, you know what? My son is in Singapore. My wife and I were in the mission field. He's there by himself in the barracks on weekends. Sometimes he goes to church. Sometimes he doesn't. And sometimes he visits with you. Can you do something? Can you pray for him? I have a heart for all the PKs, preacher's kids. In City Harvest Church, we probably have the most PKs of any church in Singapore. So I look out for him. And I tell you, every other Saturday night, for one and a half years, every other Saturday night, I would date him out. After everything's over, I finished the services, I met the people, I met my staff. About 10.30 to 11 o'clock, we'll go to Starbucks somewhere along Orchard Road. And then I'll sit down and talk to him for an hour. And man, when I first met him, he was bitter. Bitter with church, bitter with his father, bitter with life. Why should I serve the army? He was in depression. He was having suicidal thoughts. I just sat there, bought him coffee, and just listened to him pour out his grievances. I didn't say very much. I just let him talk and talk and talk. And I really don't even know what to say to him. I mean, he grew up in a Christian family. I just decided... When he's going through his valley, I'm going to be there with him. Every other night for 18 months, I did that, I did that. And after a while, he began to open up. He said, Pastor Kong, can you pray for me? You know, I'm confused, but I really believe that God loves me. What should I do with my future? And we started talking. We started sharing. He started serving in church. Let me tell you where he is today. He's in Wheaton College in the United States. Wheaton is the Harvard of the Christian schools. He's studying. He's getting ready. I called him the other day. I said, what are you going to do? He said, I think when I finish, I want to be a missionary and go to the mission field and join my dad and serve the Lord. Oh, come on, somebody. Give God a big clap. (laughs) Hallelujah. When you are consistent, You'll begin to know your sheep. And friends, you should know your sheep. Even if nobody tells you what's wrong with them. So very often we don't know what's happening with our members, especially the young people. Jesus invested three and a half years of consistent relationship with his young people. And the result was that they were willing to lay down their lives and begin to live for the cause of the kingdom. Number three, you got to be patient. 
If you want to inspire your young people, you got to be very patient. James 1.19 says, Be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to get irritated. I tell you, young people will drive you up the walls. You know, they will irritate you. One moment they're on fire for God, next moment they want to backslide. One moment they like this girl, the moment they like somebody else. One moment they want to be a doctor, the next moment they want to be a fireman, the next moment they want to go to the moon. Very often, we simply just want to rattle off advices, especially when it comes to the youth. But when we are patient to hear the story, the whole story, we can give insightful advices because we can discern the problem and give advices out of love. And I tell you one insightful advice out of love is better than a ton of scriptures that you can quote. Oh, come on, somebody give God a big hand. Hallelujah. Amen. Number four, will you be accepting? Jesus never controls. Jesus never lectures all the time. Advise all that you want, but give them the chance to make a choice and respect the choice that they make, even when you know it's a wrong choice. Let them learn the consequences of the decision making. Let them fall every once in a while. I make a promise to all the young people in the church. I say, I want you to go after your dream. I want you to go after the desires that God has put in your heart. Be as creative, expressive. Do whatever you want. If you are led by God, after you have prayed, after you have sought counsel, you make a decision, go for it. But when you fail and when you fall, pastor will be there to lift you up and help you to go again and to rise up again and do greater things again. Hallelujah. Tonight, I just want to say this. The greatest motivator in life is not visions and dreams. It's not just visions and goals. The greatest motivator in life is love. Everybody say, the greatest motivator in life is love. Turn to your neighbor and say, you got to have love. The greatest motivator if you want to inspire young people, the greatest motivator in life is love. I want to end by sharing you this verse, John 13, verse 34 and verse 35. And Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by this, all will know you are my disciples. If you have love, for one another. We need to motivate our young people to love God more. We need to motivate them to love one another more. We need to motivate them to love the church more. But it starts with us becoming loving people ourselves. Becoming more loving as a Christian. Notice what Jesus says about discipleship. If you are my disciples, the main characteristic of discipleship is a heart of love. And that's what Christianity is all about. Yes, I have tremendous visions and dreams for my life, for my ministry. But I don't want to achieve that just by programs and events and setting targets. I want all of us to serve God because of the love of God in our hearts, to build consistent loving relationship with one another. Throughout the Bible and in the history of Christianity, there have been many examples of youth who have done amazing things for Christ. Maybe they built great churches for God, started mighty revivals, or brought about a positive change in their societies. But their breakthroughs began at a common point, when they each chose to step beyond the limitations of age to embrace the call of God for their young lives. If you could read the individual autobiographies, I'm sure you'll find that earlier on in their stories, before their great and mighty exploits for God began, they first received instruction and wisdom from one or more mentors that affected how they lived their lives. 
I believe we all have the opportunity and the responsibility to make a difference in the next generation. Maybe there's a young relative or an intern at your workplace that looks up to you. Take the chance to guide, mentor, and empower him or her today. Who knows? You could be investing into the life of the next Dr. Billy Graham or Dr. David Yonggi Cho. Let me pray for you right now. Dear Lord Jesus, touch my friend watching this broadcast right now. Holy Spirit, come mightily in your power and fire. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Use us the way you have used all the young heroes of faith in the Bible. We are open and ready for a move of God. Come and mold us and give us your vision and dream. Use us to change our world for Christ and His kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We don't want your tradition. Why would I need God? There's like a lot of rules. I just don't have time. With our culture changing at a fast pace, how can the gospel fit into these lives? Kong believes we must reach the next generation now. Connect today to get your copy of Kong's three-part series, The Next Generation Initiative. In these messages, he'll share that though the gospel message may be sacred, our methods are not. Learn how to powerfully and relevantly engage with the next generation that God has put in your life. The Next Generation Initiative is a three-message series that will help you to be relevant and to gain a voice that speaks clearly into the hearts of the next generation youth. So connect with Kong at konghee.com to order a copy of The Next Generation Initiative. Kong believes we must reach the next generation now. Connect today to get your copy of Kong's three-part series, The Next Generation Initiative. Be relevant and help raise up a generation for Christ that will take the nations by storm. Son and I appreciate your love and support so much. Thank you for all your emails and letters telling us how much you've been blessed by our program. They are such an encouragement to us. We pray you have a blessed week ahead. Bye. Bye.